There was also a witness that said shortly after Sherry was murdered that they saw two men or two individuals in the dark with flashlights in that area as if they were looking for something. Police seemed to believe it was Bob and his best friend. Now, his best friend took a polygraph and failed. Bob clammed up and didn't finish his test. In the early 90s, Bob's friend admitted that at around 2.30 a.m. at a restaurant called The Green Turtle, Bob asked him to go with him back to RCC to recover an item. A second friend also told police that Bob was sobbing shortly after the murder and saying, quote unquote, he snuffed Sherry. Bob, shortly after Sherry's murder, moved out of the country. In December of 1998, Bob returned to the country. Authorities got wind of that and they got a warrant to get his DNA. So they got saliva, blood, whatever else you get for DNA and compared it to the DNA at the crime scene and it was not a match. It was conclusively not a match. Doesn't mean he wasn't there, doesn't mean he didn't commit the crime, but it means that his DNA was not at RCC. Something else that the Inside Detective Edition covered and, and talked about was there were two girls that knew Sherry being interviewed by a, a television guy or a crew and they said that Sherry told them that she was going to the library to meet her boyfriend. Now her boyfriend was cleared, his alibi checked out as he was up in San Francisco. I noticed that a lot of people have been critical of the Riverside Police Department over the years on this case. I'm not going to criticize the Riverside Police Department. You know, I would like to think that they've been working hard on the case and we don't know things that go on behind closed doors. There might be some information that they really can't release. So for me, I'd like to think that they're doing their best to this day in finding who killed Sherry. There was a theory by investigators that this person was local because he was familiar with the grounds, he was familiar with the two houses being vacant. And that could very well be true. That's a solid theory. But at the same time, when you do something as illogical as, as murder someone like they did Sherry, you're not always thinking about logic, about who sees what. I mean, obviously you don't want anyone to see you, but it very well could have been that's where they got into this argument at right there, and that's where the rage came out right there. There was another guy named Ross Sullivan. Now, Ross Sullivan had become the topic of conversation in the History Channel's series, The Hunt for the Zodiac Killer. They uh, were looking at him hard. He worked at RCC Library. He was a big guy, 6'3", 300 pounds. Uh, he wore wing walker shoes. And remember, there was a military style shoe footprint, boot print at the crime scene. And it was indented into the ground as if the person had some weight on him. According to reports, Ross enjoyed taking English classes. He enjoyed cryptography. Um, he was a notoriously bad speller. Apparently, after Sherry died, he stayed away for multiple weeks, up to six weeks, and changed into different attire now. Wasn't coming to work in the same gear. So after those three letters were sent out to Joseph Bates, the Riverside PD, and Riverside Press Enterprise, Ross moved to Santa Cruz, California. And in 1968, he was arrested for indecent exposure. Ross died in 1977 at the age of 36. They said he had been extremely obese and he succumbed to heart failure. So in the movie Zodiac, there is a scene, a small scene, where Sherry Jo Bates in that case is mentioned. Well, Paul Avery, played by Robert Downey Jr., was a writer for the San Francisco Chronicle. And he was covering the Zodiac murders. Well, the Zodiac sent Paul a Halloween card with a skeleton on the front of it. Shortly after that, Avery received a letter from someone that suggested they take a look at the Sherry Jo Bates case because it has a lot of similarities to the Zodiac case. And that this person felt that the authorities were brushing him off. So Avery took a look at it, saw some similarities, enough to say, hey, wait a minute, this could be something. And behind investigators' backs up north on the Zodiac case, he had conversation and communication with Riverside authorities about the case, so that pissed off the detectives up north, so it was a whole thing. Some of the similarities in the confession letter to the Zodiac letters were the use of the words choked and twitched and squirmed. 
Not to mention there was a little Z. Could be a two, could be a Z at the bottom of these two letters in Riverside. And remember, Zodiac did the same type of thing, same type of initial. So it could be. It also could be the Zodiac playing games. You know, he also took credit for the Riverside killing in a later letter. It also could have been somebody just writing these letters as some kind of sick joke. I mean, you never really know. And an update to this just recently, in April of 2016, which was like five years ago, another letter came in to Riverside PD, and it came from a guy that said that was him that wrote those three letters to the Riverside PD, Riverside Enterprise, and Joseph Bates, and that he was a troubled youth, troubled teen back then, and he was responsible for doing so, and he's sorry for doing that. So it has been confirmed. I'm going to read you the information that was sent out to the public regarding that letter that came in from April 2016. So it says, In April 2016, investigators received an anonymous letter postmarked from San Bernardino, California. This letter was typed and appeared to have been generated from a computer. The author of the anonymous letter admitted to writing the handwritten letters. The author apologized for sending the letters and said it was a sick joke and admitted that he was not the Zodiac killer or the killer of Sherry Jo Bates and was just looking for attention. In 2020, the Homicide Cold Case Unit and the FBI Los Angeles Investigative Genealogy Team submitted the stamp from that letter for additional DNA analysis and subsequent interviews were conducted. The individual linked to the DNA evidence on the stamp admitted to writing the letter and sending it to Riverside Police Department. The author was a young teenager at the time and had a troubled youth. He said he wrote the letter seeking attention and was remorseful for his actions. Investigators confirmed the person was not involved in the murder of Sherry Jo Bates or involved in the murders associated with the Zodiac Killer. Additional information was developed regarding a separate set of letters sent to Northern California police agencies. The author claimed to be the Zodiac Killer, but the author ultimately admitted to sending the letters to keep the investigation going. So it was March 13, 1971. A letter arrives at LA Times postmark from Pleasanton, Alameda County, and it was allegedly from the Zodiac, claiming and taking responsibility for the Sherry Joe Bates murder in Riverside. This is the letter in full. This is the Zodiac speaking like I have always said. I am crack proof. If the blue meanies are ever going to catch me, they had best get off of their fat asses and do something, because the longer they fiddle and fart around, the more slaves I will collect for my afterlife. I do have to give them credit for stumbling across my Riverside activity, but they are only finding the easy ones. There are a hell of a lot more down there. The reason I'm writing to the Times is this. They don't bury me on the back pages like some of the others. And as you can see, he uses a plus symbol instead of the word end, and he misspelled always and ever. Some of the similarities were that Zodiac sent correspondence to both authorities as well as the local newspapers covering that case. The victims from the Zodiac were majority college aged. The author of those letters also used words such as squirm and twitch. He also began sentences with but and or. And he also used double postage when he sent these letters. My pushback on the double postage is sometimes people do that to make sure that whatever you're sending gets to where it's going. Being that there was no return address, you're gonna make sure that the postage gets there. So I don't know if that really means anything. Both letters reference the murders as the game. The desktop poem reads as follows. Cut, clean, if read, clean. Blood spurting, dripping, spilling. All over her new dress. Oh well, it was red anyway. Life draining into an uncertain death. She won't die. This time someone will find her. Just wait till next time. R.H. There was a theory about the desktop poem that I kind of likened to, to making sense, in that it was unrelated to Sherry's murder, in that it could have been related to another stabbing on the same campus, Riverside City College. And it was April 13th, 1965, a guy by the name of Rollin Lynn Taft stabbed a student down by the Cutter Pool area 
at RCC. Last name Atwood. I don't have her first name here. He ended up stabbing her and he got caught for the crime. That desktop poem could have very well been related to that, written by him, written by someone that heard about the case that wanted attention for that case. But what happened in that case was this student by the last name of Atwood was walking on campus and Taft kept driving by asking her, hey, do you want to ride? And she declined. And from that, he attacked her. Almost immediately after Sherry's body was found, the school made some changes, particularly to that alleyway and to that gravel pathway. They cleared a lot of the brush there and they added some lights. Riverside Police Department held a recreation of the night of October 30th, 1966, the night she was murdered, and got everybody back, or tried to get everybody back to the library in their same cars, in their same clothes, parked in their same parking areas just to try to get fresh eyes on the crime, which is a smart thing to do to try to see what maybe they could have missed during that time. According to reports, there were two people that did not show for the recreation. It doesn't mean that they are guilty, it doesn't mean that they are innocent, but according to reports, there were two people that did not show. This case has been studied quite extensively over the years. Its potential link to Zodiac as well as the unsolved element has led to a vast amount of information based on witness accounts, evidence, publications, and hearsay. And all of this expands some 55 years at this point. Your research may have led you into different accounts and interpretation. Any differing information or opinions regarding this case is not intended to undercut anyone else's opinion based on the information that they have. Whether or not you believe Zodiac committed this murder, to me it's more important to find out the truth. I really appreciate everyone that has liked, commented, and subscribed to the channel. To me, it just gets more eyes on these cases, especially the unsolved ones. You never know. But thank you again, and we will see you soon.